Hatchet, Chapter 8 At first he thought it was a growl. In the still darkness of the shelter in the middle of the night, his eyes came open, and he was awake, and he thought there was a growl. But it was the wind, a medium wind in the pines, had made some sound that brought him up, brought him awake. He sat up and was hit with the smell. It terrified him. The smell was one of rot, some musty rot that made him think only of graves with cobwebs and dust and old death. His nostrils widened and he opened his eyes wider, but he could see nothing. It was too dark, too hard dark with clouds covering even the small light from the stars, and he could not see. But the smell was alive, alive and full and in the shelter. He thought of the bear, thought of Bigfoot and every monster he had ever seen in every fright movie he had ever watched and his heart hammered in his throat. Then he heard the slithering, a brushing sound, a slithering brushing sound near his feet. And he kicked out as hard as he could, kicked out and threw the hatchet at the sound a noise coming from his throat, but the hatchet missed, sailed into the wall where it hit the rocks with a shower of sparks, and his leg was instantly torn with pain as if a hundred needles had been driven into it. Oh! Now he screamed with the pain and fear and skittered on his backside up into the corner of the shelter, breathing through his mouth, straining to see, to hear, the slithering moved again. He thought toward him at first, and terror took him, stopping his breath. He felt he could see a low dark form, a bulk in the darkness, a shadow that lived, but now it moved away, slithering and scraping. It moved away, and he saw, or thought he saw it, go out the door opening. He lay on his side for a moment, then pulled a rasping breath in and held it, listening for the attacker to return. When it was apparent that the shadow wasn't coming back, he felt the calf of his leg, where the pain was centered and spreading to fill the whole leg. His fingers gingerly touched a group of needles that had been driven through his pants and into the fleshy part of his calf. They were stiff and very sharp on the ends that stuck out, and he knew then what the attacker had been. A porcupine had stumbled into his shelter, and when he had kicked it, the thing had slapped him with its tail of quills. He touched each quill carefully. The pain made it seem as if dozens of them had been slammed into his leg, but there were only eight pinning the cloth against his skin. He leaned back against the wall for a minute. He couldn't leave them in. They had to come out, but just touching them made the pain more intense. So fast, he thought. So fast things change. When he'd gone to sleep, he had satisfaction, and in just a moment it was all different. He grasped one of the quills, held his breath, and jerked. It sent pain signals to his brain in tight waves, but he grabbed another, pulled it, then another quill. When he had pulled four of them, he stopped for a moment. The pain had gone from being a pointed injury pain to spreading in a hot smear up his leg, and it made him catch his breath. Some of the quills were driven in deeper than others, and they tore when they came out. He breathed deeply twice, let half the breath out, and went back to work. Jerk, pause, jerk, and three more times before he lay back in the darkness, done. The pain filled his leg now, and with it came new waves of self-pity. Sitting alone in the dark, his leg aching, some mosquitoes finding him again, he started crying. It was all too much, just too much, and he couldn't take it, not the way it was. 
I can't take it this way, alone, with no fire and in the dark, and next time it might be something worse, maybe a bear, and it wouldn't be just quills in the leg, it would be worse. I can't do this, he thought, again and again. I can't. Brian pulled himself up until he was sitting upright back in the corner of the cave. He put his head down on his arms, across his knees, with stiffness taking his left leg, and cried until he was cried out. He did not know how long it took, but later he looked back on this time of crying in the corner of the dark cave and thought of it as when he learned the most important rule of survival, which was that feeling sorry for yourself didn't work. It wasn't just that it was wrong to do or that it was considered incorrect. It was more than that. It didn't work. When he sat alone in the darkness and cried and was done, all done with it, nothing had changed. His leg still hurt. It was still dark. He was still alone. And the self-pity had accomplished nothing. At last he slept again, but already his patterns were changing and the sleep was light. A resting doze more than a deep sleep, with small sounds awakening him twice in the rest of the night. In the last doze period before daylight, before he awakened finally with the morning light and the clouds of new mosquitoes, he dreamed. This time it was not of his mother, nor of the secret, but of his father at first and then of his friend Terry. In the initial segment of the dream, his father was standing at the side of a living room, looking at him, and it was clear from his expression that he was trying to tell Brian something. His lips moved, but there was no sound, not a whisper. He waved his hands at Brian, made gestures in front of his face as if he were scratching something, and he worked to make a word with his mouth. But at first, Brian could not see it. Then the lips made an mmm shape, but no sound came. Mmm, ma. Brian could not hear it, could not understand it, and he wanted to so badly. It was so important to understand his father, to know what he was saying. He was trying to help, trying so hard. And when Brian couldn't understand, he looked cross, the way he did when Brian asked questions more than once, and he faded. Brian's father faded into a fog place Brian could not see, and the dream was almost over, or seemed to be, when Terry came. He was not gesturing to Brian, but was sitting in the park at a bench, looking at a barbecue pit, and for a time nothing happened. Then he got up and poured some charcoal from a bag into the cooker, then some starter fluid, and he took a flick type of lighter and lit the fluid. When it was burning and the charcoal was at last getting hot, he turned, noticing Brian for the first time in the dream. He turned and smiled and pointed to the fire, as if to say, see, a fire. But it meant nothing to Brian except that he wished he had a fire. He saw a grocery sack on the table next to Terry. Brian thought it must contain hot dogs and chips and mustard, and he could think only of the food. But Terry shook his head and pointed again to the fire. And twice more, he pointed to the fire, made Brian see the flames. And Brian felt frustration and anger rise, and he thought, all right, all right, I see the fire, but so what? I don't have a fire. I know about fire. I know I need a fire. I know that. His eyes opened and there was light in the cave, a gray dim light of morning. He wiped his mouth and tried to move his leg, which had stiffened like wood. There was thirst and hunger, and he ate some raspberries from the jacket. They had spoiled a bit, seemed softer and mushier, but still had a rich sweetness. 
He crushed the berries against the roof of his mouth with his tongue and drank the sweet juice as it ran down his throat. A flash of metal caught his eye, and he saw his hatchet in the sand, where he had thrown it at the porcupine in the dark. He scooched up, wincing a bit when he bent his stiff leg, and crawled to where the hatchet lay. He picked it up and examined it, and saw a chip in the top of the head. The nick wasn't large, but the hatchet was important to him, was his only tool, and he should not have thrown it. He should keep it in his hand and make a tool of some kind to help push an animal away. Make a staff, he thought, or a lance, and save the hatchet. Something came then. A thought... As he held the hatchet, something about the dream and his father and Terry, but he couldn't pin it down. Ugh! He scrambled out and stood in the morning sun and stretched his back muscles and his sore leg. The hatchet was still in his hand, and as he stretched and raised it over his head, it caught the first rays of the morning sun. The first faint light hit the silver of the hatchet, and it flashed a brilliant gold in the light, like fire. That is it, he thought, what they were trying to tell me. Fire. The hatchet was the key to it all. When he threw the hatchet at the porcupine in the cave and missed and hit the stone wall, it had showered sparks. A golden shower of sparks in the dark, as golden with fire as the sun was now. The hatchet was the answer. That's what his father and Terry had been trying to tell him. Somehow he could get fire from the hatchet. The sparks would make fire. Brian went back into the shelter and studied the wall. It was some sort of chalky granite or a sandstone, but embedded in it were large pieces of a darker stone, a harder and darker stone. It only took him a moment to find where the hatchet had struck. The steel had nicked into the edge of one of the darker stone pieces. Brian turned the head backward so he would strike with the flat rear of the hatchet and hit the black rock gently, too gently, and nothing happened. He struck harder, a glancing blow, and two or three weak sparks skipped off the rock and died immediately. He swung harder, held the hatchet so it would hit a longer, sliding blow, and the black rock exploded in fire. Sparks flew so heavily that several of them skittered and jumped on the sand beneath the rock, and he smiled and struck again and again. There could be fire here, he thought. I will have a fire here, he thought, and struck again. I will have fire from the hatchet. And that's the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9 Brian found it was a long way from sparks to fire. Clearly there had to be something for the sparks to ignite, some kind of tinder or kindling. But what? He brought some dried grass in, tapped sparks into it, and watched them die. He tried small twigs, breaking them into little pieces, but that was worse than the grass. Then he tried a combination of the two, Grass and twigs. Nothing. He had no trouble getting sparks, but the tiny bits of hot stone or metal, he couldn't tell which they were, just sputtered and died. He settled back on his haunches in exasperation, looking at the pitiful clump of grass and twigs. He needed something finer, something soft and fine and fluffy to catch the bits of fire. Shredded paper would be nice, but he had no paper. So close, he said aloud. So close. He put the hatchet back in his belt and went out of the shelter, limping on his sore leg. 
There had to be something. Had to be. Man had made fire. There had been fire for thousands, millions of years. There had to be a way. He dug in his pockets and found the $20 bill in his wallet. Paper. Worthless paper out here. But if he could get a fire going... He ripped the 20 into tiny pieces, made a pile of pieces, and hit sparks into them. Nothing happened. They just wouldn't take the sparks. But there had to be a way, some way to do it. Not 20 feet to his right, leaning out over the water, were birches. And he stood looking at them for a full half minute before they registered on his mind. They were a beautiful white, with bark like clean, slightly speckled paper. Paper. He moved to the trees. Where the bark was peeling from the trunks, it lifted in tiny tendrils, almost fluffs. Brian plucked some of them loose, rolled them in his fingers. They seemed flammable, dry and nearly powdery. He pulled and twisted bits off the trees, packing them in one hand while he picked them with the other, picking and gathering until he had a wad close to the size of a baseball. Then he went back into the shelter and arranged the ball of birch bark peelings at the base of the black rock. As an afterthought, he threw in the remains of the $20 bill. He struck and a stream of sparks fell into the bark and quickly died. But this time, one spark fell on one small hair of dry bark, almost a thread of bark, and seemed to glow a bit brighter before it died. The material had to be finer. There had to be a soft and incredibly fine nest for the sparks. I must make a home for the sparks, he thought. A perfect home, or they won't stay. They won't make fire. He started ripping the bark, using his fingernails at first, and when that didn't work, he used the sharp edge of the hatchet, cutting the bark in thin slivers, hairs so fine they were almost not there. It was painstaking work, slow work, and he stayed with it for over two hours. Twice he stopped for a handful of berries and once to go to the lake for a drink. Then back to work, the sun on his back, until at last he had a ball of fluff as big as a grapefruit. Dry birch bark fluff. He positioned his spark nest, as he thought of it, at the base of the rock, used his thumb to make a small depression in the middle, and slammed the back of the hatchet down across the black rock. A cloud of sparks rained down, most of them missing the nest, but some, perhaps 30 or so, hit in the depression. And of those, six or seven found fuel and grew, smoldered and caused the bark to take on the red glow. Then they went out. Close. He was close. He repositioned the nest, made a new and smaller dent with his thumb, and struck again. More sparks, a slight glow, then nothing. It's me, he thought. I'm doing something wrong. I do not know this. A cave dweller would have had a fire by now. A crow magnon man would have had a fire by now. But I don't know this. I don't know how to make a fire. Maybe not enough sparks. He settled the nest in place once more and hit the rock with a series of blows as fast as he could. The sparks poured like a golden waterfall. At first they seemed to take. There were several, many sparks that found life and took briefly, but they all died. Starved. He leaned back. They are like me. They are starving. It wasn't quantity. There were plenty of sparks, but they needed more. I would kill, he thought suddenly, for a book of matches. Just one book. Just one match. I would kill. 
What makes fire? He thought back to school, to all those science classes. Had he ever learned what made a fire? Did a teacher ever stand up there and say, this is what makes a fire? He shook his head, tried to focus his thoughts. What did it take? You have to have fuel, he thought. And he had that. The bark was fuel, oxygen. There had to be air. He needed to add air. He had to fan on it, blow on it. He made the nest ready again, held the hatchet backward, tensed, and struck four quick blows. Sparks came down, and he leaned forward as fast as he could and blew too hard. There was a bright, almost intense glow. Then it was gone. He had blown it out. Another set of strikes, more sparks. He leaned and blew, but gently this time, holding back and aiming the stream of air from his mouth to hit the brightest spot. Five or six sparks had fallen in a tight mass of bark hair, and Brian centered his efforts there. The sparks grew with his gentle breath. The red glow moved from the sparks themselves into the bark, moved and grew and became worms, glowing red worms that crawled up the bark hairs and caught other threads of bark and grew until there was a pocket of red as big as a quarter, a glowing red coal of heat. And when he ran out of breath and paused to inhale, the red ball suddenly burst into flame. Fire, he yelled. I've got fire. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. But the flames were thick and oily and burning fast, consuming the ball of bark as fast as if it were gasoline. He had to feed the flames, keep them going. Working as fast as he could, he carefully placed the dried grass and wood pieces he had tried at first on top of the bark and was gratified to see them take. But they would go fast. He needed more and more. He could not let the flames go out. He ran from the shelter to the pines and started breaking off the low, dead, small limbs. These he threw in the shelter, went back for more, threw those in, and squatted to break and feed the hungry flames. When the small wood was going well, he went out and found larger wood, and did not relax until that was going. Then he leaned back against the wood brace of his door opening and smiled. I have a friend, he thought. I have a friend now. A hungry friend, but a good one. I have a friend named Fire. Hello, Fire. The curve of the rock back made an almost perfect drawing flue that carried the smoke up through the cracks of the roof, but held the heat. If he kept the fire small, it would be perfect and would keep anything like the porcupine from coming through the door again. A friend and a guard, he thought, so much from a little spark a friend and a guard from a tiny spark. He looked around and wished he had somebody to tell this thing, to show this thing he had done. But there was nobody. Nothing but the trees and the sun and the breeze and the lake. Nobody. And he thought, rolling thoughts, with the smoke curling up over his head and the smile still half on his face, he thought, I wonder what they're doing now. I wonder what my father is doing now. I wonder what my mother is doing now. I wonder if she is with him. And that's the end of chapter 9.